We've worked on Adar already. We had in Rosh Chodesh Adar Aleph, we, we worked on the, the concepts of Adar and the meaning of Adar. So today we'll get more into, into the Megillah and Purim in ways that are, are relevant to us. What's important to understand is that the moment in the Megillah of Vayosar HaMelech et Tabato Asher Hevir Mehaman Vayitnehu Lemordechai, at that moment when the king takes the ring off Haman's hand, or the king that he had given to Haman, and passes it over to Mordechai, Vatasem Esther at Mordechai al Beit Haman, and Esther appoints Mordechai over the, uh, the portfolio of, of Haman. So Mordechai now becomes the, the viceroy of Persia under the, under the king and queen. That was the turning moment of the story, isn't that so? From then on, everything goes well. That was the moment that everything changes. And we tend to see that as the moment at the beginning of the nace, but that isn't when the nace started. When did the miracle start? So if we go back a little bit, a few chapters back, it starts with Achar Advarim Ha'ele Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh Et Haman Ben Amdata Agagi Vayin Asayu. It starts with Haman being appointed as as the prime minister, as the the head person of Paras. Had Haman not been appointed to that position, that the story wouldn't have played out. So if you look at and say, well, what what was that? The fact that Haman is appointed, that's where it really starts. And he's given the office of the senior minister in the cabinet. And on that, if we want to go a little bit more deeply into that, the Gemara says, oh, my Rav, Rav says in the Gemara in Megillah, what does it mean? So there's a continuation. This is an unfolding story. And we tend to look at the miracle as kind of the end of the story. It ends miraculously. But, but let's go f- further into it. What about the middle of the story? And the middle of the story, it says, Acharad Varim Haman was appointed after the evolution of these events. What's the evolution, says Rava? Achar Shebara HaKadosh Baruch Hu Rufu'ala Maka. The Rebbein Shalom always creates the cure before the disease. The solution is always there. We've just got to find it. You don't have to create a solution. When a, a serious problem hits the Jewish people, you know the solution is already in existence. You've just got to discover it. does not strike Israel unless there's already a refuah. And, and that's important to, for us to understand throughout history, that whenever we've been struck, the seeds of the solution are in place long before the, the tragedy actually strikes. And Rabbeinu Bechaya says in the Kadach HaKemach, also on this question of Achar HaDvarim Ha'ele, in the Kadach HaKemach, in the section on Purim, the first part of the of the Purim chapters in the Kadach HaKemach of Rabbeinu Bechaya, is he goes through the key points in the Megillah, section by section. It's very beautiful. And on this one where he says, Achar HaDvarim Ha'ele, Achar Shebara HaKadosh Baruch Hu based on the Gemara and Megillah, after Hashem had created the solution, had created the cure, after that, Haman is elevated to the position of prime minister. What was the refua? What was the solution that Hashem had created before the Makkah? That Esther was taken into the king's house. Now, go back and, and look at that situation and think what that was for Esther. For Esther, that, that wasn't winning some kind of a beauty contest. For Esther, that was one of the, the big, that was the biggest tragedy of her life. That she was forced to go and, and live with Achashverosh. What did that mean for Mordechai? What did he feel about Esther going off and living in the, in the palace of, of Achashverosh? So if you think about that tragic moment, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that, that tragic moment was the solution for the real tragedy which was still to come. You just see how blind we are, how unable we are to understand the meaning of events. Things that, that, that look to us like tragedies, things that look to us like the ends of the stories or the beginning of the stories, just very difficult. And we, we'll see through our discussion tonight just an approach to understanding the unfolding of history. She'al yada ba'agula yil Israel. At the end of the day, it was through that. If Esther hadn't been taken in as as a Hashverosh's queen, what, 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 how would the story have unfolded? That had to happen. So as tragic as it was in that moment, it had to happen. It was inevitable for, in order for the rest of the story to be able to unfold. So how did Esther land up as, as a Hashverosh's wife? So we've got to go further back. You know the story, we're going back to the beginning of the Megillah now, the big party. Vashti is there. 
The king calls Vashti to come to his chambers. She refuses. The king was furious and, and he's incredibly angry. But if she wouldn't have refused, Esther would never have become queen. If Esther would never have become queen, there wouldn't have been a guru. Nothing would have happened. History would not have happened the way it did if she didn't get it into her crazy head to disobey the king. Why did she do that? What sense would that have made? Says the Gemara in Megillah, Omar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Chanina, why didn't she come? There was a reason she didn't come. She got a terrible skin disease. And she felt embarrassed. She's, she's being asked to come in front of all these princes and men and people from all over. The, all over. And she's, she's got Sarat. She's got this terrible skin disease. She looks awful. The king's been boasting and showing off, bragging about his wife. And he says, come, let me show you off to all my friends. And, and she's going to walk in there with Sarat. Thank God she got Sarat. She must have woken up and looked in the mirror and seen that she, that she had this terrible skin disease. And she must have said, why do bad things happen to good people? What have I done to deserve this? What have I done? I've tried my best. I've done my best. On the day that I'm meant to be the queen of the moment, I break out in this terrible skin disease. Why? What kind of timing is this? But if that wouldn't have happened, the story wouldn't have unfolded. Why did she break out into Tzarat? Why did she get it? Amar Rava. Rava says, this, come on, the, whole, the whole sugi there in Megillah is amazing. Yom HaShvi'i Shabbat Haya. She's Yisrael Veshotin. This was on Shabbos and the Jews are busy having their suudot, they're eating. Matchilin B'divrei Torah V'divrei Tishbachot. How do Jews begin their Friday night dinner? They start with some zmiras and they have divrei Torah. That's how, that's how they start. But the nations of the world are having a party. They discuss, they, they, they start talking meaninglessly. And they're talking about who's got the nicest women, which culture, which society has got the most beautiful women. That's their conversation kicking off their celebrations. While at the same time around the Jewish tables, we're talking divreter and we're singing zmirot. And that's exactly what was happening at the Suda of that wicked man, Achashverosh. They were talking about who has the most beautiful women. My beautiful utensil, my precious ornament. She's not from Madai, she's not from Paris. All these places you're talking about, that's not where my queen comes from. Ela Kasti, she comes from Kasti. Would you like to see what beauty is? You guys don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about whether the Parsim, you, you don't even know what you're talking about. Amrulo in, they said, yes, we would love to see her. Uvil Vajshitahe Aruma, provided she comes naked. If we're gonna, if we're gonna see her, we want to really see her. Crazy discussion at the king's banquet. In Buckingham Palace, this probably wouldn't be the normal kind of a conversation. One would, what? Don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. Don't Adam modeid bo modedim lo. So why was she subjected to that terrible humiliation? The, the Gemara is not afraid to ask the why question. Why did that happen to her? Why would she be called upon to come naked to the, the party of the king? Why would that happen? Mido keneged mida, says the Gemara, because don't think Vashti is such a tzadikus. Who is this Vashti? She's a good shidduch for Achashverosh. She's as wicked as he is. She used to bring Jewish girls who mafshitan and she used to strip them naked and make them serve in their palace on Shabbos. She used to wreck the Jewish Shabbosim by taking the young girls from their homes and bringing them into a public place, into the palace, stripping them naked and making them serve naked. That's what Vashti used to do. Do you understand why Vashti now is called to, to present herself naked? Absolute midah kaneh midah, what justice. And when she's about to go and present herself, she's got sarat, and she makes the king angry, and it becomes the end of her life. This is all a consequence of her own behavior. 
דכתיב אחר הדברים האלה, כאשר חמת המלך אשפחו, זכרת ושתי ואת אשר עשתה, ואת אשר נגזר עליה. The king remembered what Vashti had did, this is a little later on, you remember, the king starts feeling lonely, and he remembers Vashti, and what she had done, ואת אשר נגזר עליה, and he doesn't say what I decreed. It doesn't say ואת אשר גזרתי עליה. I remembered, or אשר גזר עליה, what I, or what was decreed, אשר נגזר. What was decreed on her by Hashem. You know, that's the words that come out of Achashverosh's mouth, whether Achashverosh really understands that this was all of a godly plan or, or not, but we understand that this was all part of a plan. Keshem she'asta, kach nigzar aleha. Exactly as she did, was decreed upon her. She goes, amida keneged mida. So now look back and think how the Jewish people felt in Shushan on Friday nights when the police used to arrive and take the girls. What did that feel like? And were they asking, why is this happening? And what can we do? And, and, and how they must have felt about it. Bear in mind, as we'll see later, Rashi says in the first Rashi and the Megillah, whether this is historically accurate the way we know history or not doesn't make a difference. This is how we have to understand the sequence of the stories. This was three years after Ezra went back to Eretz Yisrael. And we're aware of the return to Israel by, by Ezra at the invitation of, of the king of King Koresh, But very few people actually went. Life was good in Shushan. It was a good place to be. Business was good. There was money. And people stayed in Shushan. And then all of a sudden, things got bad. And now the, the, the Jewish families are finding themselves every Friday night dreading that knock on the door where the police officers come to take their children away. Their children. So in their lives, this was tragic. In their lives, this was such torture. And it was, but if it wouldn't have happened, if Vashti would not have been so wicked, and she would not have taken the Jewish girls, then she wouldn't have been called to become, to strip naked herself. And if she wouldn't have been to, called to strip naked herself, she would have gone to the party, and she wouldn't have got Sarat. And if she went to the party, he wouldn't have killed her. And if he didn't kill her, we wouldn't have had Esther in the palace. And then what would Jewish history have been? So these young girls who were called on Friday night to go to the palace, they were the korbanot. They were the sacrifices that needed to be made in order for history to play out the way it needed to be played out afterwards. And was that normal? As we, as we read the story, was that normal? No, it was not normal. That's also supernatural, that a queen would do that. That this whole, this whole sequence of events doesn't make natural sense. It's not the kind of thing you would expect to read in the newspapers about, about the king and the queen and the Jewish people. This was already Nisim. And I mentioned, I think, in the first year we had together, that we, we've got to understand Nisim don't, are not always happy. Nisim aren't always, and they lived happily after in the, in, in the castle and the girl became a princess. That, that's not always how a nice is. Sometimes nisim are harsh. Nis means lamala min ateva. It's something supernatural. And supernatural doesn't always mean pleasant, doesn't always mean comfortable. So the nisim of Purim start with these stories. When the police used to knock at the Jewish doors and take the Jewish girls to the palace on Friday night, that was nis. Had they known that was nis, they could have said a shechianu. Of course, how do you do that? You're living under such terrible circumstances. And that's part of the Jewish experience, to be able to live simultaneously with tragedy and miracle. And understand that in the tragedy there can be miracle. That in the tra tragedy itself there can be nice. To know that that is the case, although you can't yet see it. That's the idea of a nice nistar. What is the idea of a nice nistar? Which is, we talked about at the Rosh Chodesh Ada uh, a month ago, this, this year. A nice nistar is exactly that. You can't see the miracle. It doesn't look like a miracle. And not just it doesn't look like a miracle because it looks natural. It doesn't look like a miracle because it's tragic. Why would God make such a miracle? We don't always understand why. There's not always an answer to the why question when it comes to Nisim. But to be able to understand that even something so tragic can be beget and nice, that can already be a miracle. So when we think about history, and, and we think about history from a perspective of causality, We have to go back to the, to the initial, to the kernel of the historic event. Because the kernel of the historic event probably occurred decades before and sometimes centuries before. 
But you can't just look at a snapshot of history and try and understand it. You can't say, why the Holocaust? Holocaust started when? The late 1930s. Is that when it started? Or did it start First World War already? Did it start first, first World War? Or did it start long before First World War? When are you going to say Holocaust started? If you do what we've just done, if you follow history through, when did it start? And if you want to get any kind of understanding of history, how big does your perspective have to be to be able to see the patterns rather than to look at a snapshot event and think that, that, that you can kind of make sense out of, out of that? You can't make sense out of a snapshot. You can only make, that would be like going to the movies and watching one, one frame, one frame from it and say, I don't understand the movie. It's not making sense to me. Of course you don't understand the movie. You're looking at one snapshot. This is a two and a half hour movie. You didn't start at the beginning. You haven't gone to the end. How can you understand it? Life is a movie. History is a movie. And unless you're able to watch the whole movie, which we're not, there's no way you can understand it at all. If, you, if we can go back as far as we can, we can understand bits of the movie. The famous Medrash in, in Parsha Shmot, where the daughters of Yisra say to him, when Yisra says, how come you came back so quickly? What, is it, what do they answer? Ish Mitzri, an ish, a Mitzri saved us. And you know the various Chazal on that, why it wasn't Egyptian, it was Moshe. Well, he was dressed like an Egyptian, and that's held against him, the fact that they didn't know all the, all the, all the various discussions. Mashal says the Medrash, Le'echad shenashachor ha'arod. There was a man who got bitten by a scorpion. V'hayaratz liten raglav b'mayim. And he ran off to, to put his feet into the water. He was, they were stinging, he was, it, was, it was poisoned. He, puts, he wants to put his foot into the water. He goes to the river to bathe his feet in the water and he sees a baby is just being washed away by the river. He puts out his hand and he saves the baby. The child or the parent of the child says, Thank God, thank you. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be alive. It wasn't me. I did what anybody would have done in my position. I, it was a reflex action. I didn't even think about it. There's nothing to thank me for. Ela ha'arod shenashachani. Who do you have to thank? You have to thank the scorpion. It bit me. Uvarachti yemena. I ran away. Who hitzilcha? The scorpion saved you. Now, if you're looking at the snapshot of the moment when the scorpion bit the man, do you think he was sitting there saying, Ah, scorpion, my friend. You are a lover of the Jewish people. I can see through you a Jewish child will be saved. Thank you for biting me. Now at that moment he's swearing and he's shouting and he's yelling and he's screaming. And he can't understand why this has happened to him. It's tragic. And yet if you watch the movie a little bit further, that becomes the salvation of the child. You've got to see the movie. Thank you, Moshe Rabbeinu, for saving us from these shepherds. Now, I actually killed an Egyptian because the Egyptian was being cruel to a Jew. So what, what was that moment like? The Egyptian is murdering a Jew. Moshe intervenes and kills the Egyptian. Moshe's life is now at risk. Moshe must know, Binavua, that he has an important part to play in the Geulah and bringing B'nai Israel out of Mitzrayim ultimately. And it's all, he's blown it. At that moment, he must have said to himself, I've blown my mission. I killed the Egyptian, and maybe that was the right thing to do, but now I'm on the run, so I can't be there for my people. So his whole life that he had mapped out in front of him, I'm sitting there in the king's palace in a position to help the Jewish people, in a position to save the Jewish people. It's so clear why Hashem has put me in this position. I can see my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to be second to Pharaoh. And through that, to be, to be a, a melitz for the Jewish people and ultimately to play a part in the gula. And in a moment, his whole future disappears. Because now he's a refugee, now he's got to run, and he runs off to Midian. But it's that Egyptian that I had to kill that caused me to run and to be here when you needed me here. And that's why they said to their father, it was an Egyptian man that Moshe killed that caused Moshe to be at the well, at the well when we needed him and he helped him. So that's when we look at historic events, it's important to go back to the beginning of the movie as far as we can possibly go back and to, and to study it early in its, in, in its origins.
And I've said to you before, I think also in the first year that we had together, many of you weren't at that year, that October the 7th was unbelievable Nisim, tragic Nisim, the same as, as being bitten by a scorpion, the same as uh, killing the Egyptian, the same as the Jewish girls being hauled off on Friday nights to Vashti and Akashverosh. These were terrible tragedies, but they were the genesis of the nace. They were the genesis of the miracle. And, and we've talked before that Israel was caught asleep, was miraculous. There's no other way to explain it. They're going to come out with these reports and they're going to do these investigations. And as I've said to you before, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure you share the view. When we get the reports, we're not going to read them and say, ah, now I understand what happened. Now it makes sense. We are going to be as stunned as we are now. How could this have happened? How could so many of things gone wrong? How could things under our noses not be noticed? How could so many reports be ignored? What, what went on? How could people, so many people, be so blind for so long? It's not normal. If it's not normal, it's a miracle. And, and again, miracle doesn't have to be pleasant. They're miracles, sometimes they're korbanot. And a miracle, they're korbanot. We saw with the Jewish girls in Shushan, there are korbanot. There are sacrifices. Did it have to be that way? Well, one thing I feel sure about is it had to be that in October, the Simchas, Simchas Torah this year, the Jewish people were going to come together. That clearly was decided. How they come together, that was, that was our doing. We chose the hard way. Because if you remember what we were like on October the 6th, and on Yom Kippur in, in Tel Aviv, and, and if you just put your mind back to those days, there was nothing else that could have brought us together, except something as tragic and as difficult as, and as surprising as that. That brought us together in ways that nothing else could have brought us together. So we made it impossible, so to say, to bring about our unity any way other than through tragedy, unfortunately. But it created the tragedy, it created the unity. On October the 6th, people were saying, the Zionist idealism, the Zionist dream is over. Israel has lost its identity. People are leaving, money is leaving. You remember what was going on. It's important that we remember these things. It's important to look back, look back at some of the newspaper articles from before October the 6th, to realize how seriously concerned people were about the capacity of Eretz Israel to continue. It was by no means taken for granted that we would be able to save ourselves. Questions of the army's capacity, business capacity, uh, just the, the human spirit, all, all the things that were being asked, the politics that was going on at the time. Were we going to implode from within or was there going to be a way that Israel could be saved? It's something that wasn't clear. In a matter of, of hours, if that, it became clear that we're here, that we're okay, that we're together, and that we're going to come right. All that happened in hours. The Nahapohu happened in our lifetime. The Nahapohu happened from a literal the Nahapohu, from almost certain implosion to almost certain reborn idealism. And it happened in a matter of hours. What's very clear is we're in a part of history. History is unfolding in, in front of our eyes. We don't know where we're in the middle of the story. And even if we can go back, go back to October the 7th, how much be longer before October the 7th do we have to go back to? Uh, do we go back to the founding of the state? Do we go back to the Holocaust? How, how far back does, where does this movie actually start? Difficult to know. But we certainly don't know where it ends because we're right in the middle of the movie. But one thing is clear, there is a historic movie playing out. Big things are happening. Amazing things are happening. Some of us were talking about it just before, the number of, of, of Nisim, of miracles that we're all seeing every day, the acts of Chesed and Stoker, the wonders, just what the things we're seeing every single day are things we didn't believe we would be seeing. The righteousness, the tzidkus, the, uh, the young people who are in the army, the people who've been wounded, uh, what the kind of things they're saying, the spirit of the army, what's going on in, in, in those, to, to whatever extent we have the opportunity to, to hear about it, and what's going on in the communities and in the cities uh, around Israel and in the world beyond. So in a situation like this where history is unfolding, we have three choices. What's important for us is not the understanding of history, and uh, we're limited. What's important for us is what are we, how we're reacting, how we're responding. So we've got three choices. One choice is we can obstruct. We can get in the way. 
we can return to the bickering that we had before, we can get into politicking, we can break down the progress that has already been made, we can weaken the country, we can strengthen our enemies. That's one thing we can do, we can, we can obstruct. The second thing we can do is we can stand back and observe. Very interesting, let's watch, let's see what's going to happen. And we can observe the unfolding of history. And the third choice is to participate and enable it. We can't affect it. There's nothing we can do. We can't do anything to change the course of history. There is such a powerful torrent driving events at the moment. If we haven't got that right, when will we get it right? We should have started getting this right at the beginning of COVID, if not long before then. That there's just a torrent of events in the world over which we have no control at all. And one thing is over and then something else happens. And it's all things that we can't, we can't control, we can't predict. Our predictions have all gone wrong. Nothing we predicted was, was correct with all the scientific knowledge that was available before COVID and during COVID and all these experts and all the big data. Read the predictions now. Read now what the experts were saying at the, during the first six months of COVID and it's childish. It's ridiculous. It's so ignorant. But then they were experts. How long does it take for us to realize there are no experts? We, we try and we understand and we, and, and we do what, what, what we can do, but to really know what's happening and why and to be able to predict, it's quite interesting that in, in Lashon HaKodesh, in Hebrew, there's no word for prediction and there's no word for expectation. We can't predict and we can't have an expectation. And then Mitzapeh, I have a vision. I have a vision of something. But I can't predict and I can't expect we understand that the future is beyond us. But we can participate or not participate. We can be, be a part of the unfolding of events and play a part in this history, or we can stand on the sidelines and watch, or we can obstruct. Those are our, those are our choices. And isn't that where Esther was when Mordechai confronts her and says, Vayomer Mordechai la shivel Esther alte dami benafshech di malet beit hamelech mikol hayudim. Don't think you will escape anti-Semitism. Don't think you can live in London or in Manchester or in New York or in Los Angeles and you'll be okay because your community is okay because you're living in your little bubble. Esther, you're in the safest bubble any Jew will ever live in. Your bubble is safer than Los Angeles and London and Manchester and New York and Paris, much safer where Esther was. She's in the house of the king. Don't think you're not going to be caught up in the same anti-Semitism. What you need to know, Esther, is you have the choice to be quiet. You can say, I'm in my bubble. I shouldn't put my life at risk because I'm the only thing the Jews have got. I've got a Hashverish's ear. The worst thing I could do would be to risk my life. You can say that and decide to be an observer. But Revach Vatsalai Amod Leyudim Makom Acher. Jewish history is going to unfold, with or without you. And the Jewish people are not going to be wiped out. So you know for sure things are going to happen and you can't control them. But you won't be part of the unfolding history. You'll stay where you are. And history will pass you by. And who knows? Perhaps, it's kind of quite funny almost, Mordechai saying perhaps, and isn't, wouldn't he be certain? I mean, if he was a Hasidic Rebbe, he would say, I'm telling you, that's why you've been put here. This is the purpose of your life. You've been put here for this purpose. Mordechai says, maybe it's possible. Maybe this is why you've been put here, to, to intervene at this particular time. Says the Ibn Ezra, Shema lo higat l'malchut ela ba'avur ha'et hazot shetoshi i et Yisrael. You've been put here so that you can be the Savior. Not that Yisrael can be saved. Yisrael is going to be saved in any event. Your choice is just, do you want to be the savior or not? What role do you want to play in it? That's your choice. You need to know that there will come salvation and it won't be from you. Your moment of choice is now. And your moment of choice is not about impacting history. You're a little person, like all of us. You can't impact history. But you can, play in the, you can play a role in it. And that's your choice. There's a, a, a wonderful sefer written by a 
by our, our cousin, yours even more than, than, than ours, well, married, was married to our cousin, Rebbe Avil Orenstein, who lives in it, so today lives in, in Telstone, an enormous Talmud Chochem. In tomorrow's Matmonim Shir, I'll be quoting him on, on a, in a Baal Hamor. On a, he wrote a, an important set of Svarim on the, on the Baal Hamor. Uh, but he also wrote a wonderful set of Perushim on the Megillot. And he weaves the Chazal into, into the way he ex- explains the Megillot. And, and this piece, too, he explains and, and says, Ki lo shayach shetiye kalaya bayudim chas v'sholem. It's not possible that the Jews are going to be wiped out. That's not one of the ways the story is going to unwind. We don't know how the story is going to unwind. But one thing we do know, the end of the story is not going to be, and then there were no more Jews. That's not going to be the end of the story. But you might not be one of those. It doesn't mean every Jew will be saved. It means the Jewish people will be saved. Whether or not you'll be part of that depends on the role you choose to play at the moment. And then he says, and maybe this is why you've been put here, because Shishaul Melech, your great-great-grandfather was Shaul, and he was Pasha, and Shaul slipped up, and he didn't wipe Amalek out when he could have. Now again, history was going to play out one way or another, and clearly for the story of Purim to take place, Amalek had to survive at that particular time. So what Shaul did was predestined, but Shaul chose to be the vehicle of sparing Amalek. Shaul was not the cause of Amalek sparing. No human being is the cause of anything that happened in history. There's only one cause of what happens in history, and that's Asher. But people choose whether or not they're involved, and Shaul chose to be the one. I will be the tool that will leave Amalek alive. And therefore, because of that, you've been given an opportunity to do tshuva. You can now fix that flaw by getting rid of, of Haman. That's your opportunity. And if you don't fix it up, your family is going to suffer from that. And Esther answers him and says, Mordechai, you're right. I'll do my bit. But don't think you're so innocent. You've got work to do as well. You're the leader of the people. They were partaking of that suda. They took part in the, of that, at that party of Achashverosh. And that's how the story started. Go and get them to do tshuva. And that's where Tanya Esther comes from. Get the people to fast and get the people to do tshuva. I can't do my piece if the nation isn't doing their piece. And you're the leader of the nation. So I'll, I'll take what you've said, I'll take the lead with Achashverosh, you take the lead with the people, and she instructs him to, to go ahead and do that. There's the famous piece, so, so beautiful, you probably know it by heart, of, of, of Tolstoy and War and Peace. Man lives consciously for himself. The decisions we make are about our own little life. Should I eat now or should I eat later? Should I go to Tel Aviv tomorrow or should I go to Tel Aviv the next day? We make these little decisions all the time but is an unconscious instrument in the attainment of the historic universal aims of humanity. But without even realizing it, the choices we make, and we think we're making them for ourselves, we're actually part of the playing out of of history. A deed done is irrevocable, and its result coinciding in time with the actions of millions of other men assumes a historic significance. Every little person does something, and the energy of everybody's actions comes together and flows together, and eventually it becomes a torrent of actions that affect history. But that torrent is made up of all the little droplets that are you and me. That's, it's not one person who makes these decisions. Everybody's de- decisions affect the decisions of society and of history. And the higher a man stands on the social ladder, the more people he is connected with and the more power he has over others, the more evident is the predestination and inevitability of his every action. And that's what, what Mordechai says to Esther. You're in a position. We're all in a position. She says, everybody's in a position. You've all got to go and daven. You've all got to go and tru- do tshuva. It's not just one person. Every single person has to pl- play. The, the, every action coincides in time with the actions of millions of others. Everybody has to be in this together. And I'll do my piece, says, says Mordechai, because you're in a position where your inf- influence is greater than anybody else's. And so... If we're sitting at this moment and we're saying, I don't know what's happening, all I know is we're living in miraculous times. The things that are happening we've never seen before in our lifetime and and in some ways in history. 
starting with October the 7th, as I said, we, we don't know that's where the movie started. Clearly, the movie didn't start then. But, but even if we just start then, just, just in the last five months, what we've been through, what we're seeing, what we're observing overseas and here in the world and in it as well, just an amazing sequence of, of events. We can choose to abstract, to observe, or to participate. What does participation look like? What are we meant to be doing? What are you and I meant to be doing? If we can't get into our army uniform, like, like Rabin Yamin over there went into to enlist today, if we're not in that position, what, what do we do? And what I want to put before you is to be aware of the genesis of three trends. I'm not saying they are only trends, I'm just saying they're three important trends. And understanding these trends are at their genesis, and therefore that's their most dangerous time, because when things are just at their beginning, they can easily be stifled. And so to be aware of these trends and to participate in them, not to observe them, not to abstract them, but to participate in them. The first trend is to understand that a new border has been created. And it's not the borders of 1948, and it's not the borders of 1967, and it's not the uh, security wall ar around Gaza. A new border has been created, not by us. A new border has been created by the world. The world has created a ghetto and has put us in the ghetto. It doesn't matter where we're living in the world, we're in a ghetto. And that's a reality, again, that Haman recognizes. There's this one unique nation. They're, they're scattered around and yet they're united. They're different from everybody else. They don't keep the laws and, and statutes of the king. What we have to realize is we're in it on our own. We don't have allies. The allies that we have are in it for themselves. The United States is not supporting us because they love us. They're supporting us because it's strategically important for them, and they recognize that. And whoever else is supporting us, and they'll support us for as long as it's in their interest. We've seen that in all the previous situations that we've had. When it got too much for them, they said, enough, war over. And we have a choice, either to understand, hey, I'm levadad yishkon, we're a, an isolated nation, and we don't have allies, and that's okay, because we've got Hashem. Or we're going to try and work with strategic alliances and we're going to work with allies. So to realize that one of the changes in history is that for 75 years, again, just starting then, but the movie starts long before then, for 75 years, we have relied on the Goyim to support us. And that's no longer possible. That doesn't mean they won't support us. That doesn't mean we don't have to use whatever support they give us. That doesn't mean we have to, don't have to use every diplomatic method to try and keep these strategic alliances alive and going. That's our hishtadlus. But we need to know at the end of the day, this is an amechad. We're a unique nation. And again, as Rabbi Vil Orenstein says, Kilahem orachayim ruchani shel tamud Torah shmirat mitzvot ve'en ki etzalafam. These people keep Torah and mitzvot. There's nobody else that, that's like them. However, he makes an unbelievable point. Sometimes they don't keep the Torah. They came to the king's party and not everybody ordered a kosher meal in, in, in boxes with, with aluminum foil. Some people had fish. They didn't, they didn't have the chazer, but they had the fish. Some people had the vegetables. They also sometimes slip up when it comes to keeping of the mitzvot. If the Jews never slipped up and stayed faithful to the Torah under all circumstances, you couldn't accuse them of not following your laws. But if when it suits them, they give up the Torah in any case, why don't they give up the Torah to follow your laws? When it suits them not to keep Shabbos, they don't keep Shabbos. So what about when you tell them not to keep Shabbos? Then all of a sudden they're religious. Sorry, this is against our religious, our religious tradition. We can't do this. You have a person who, who, who lies and steals in business and he comes to court and they say, will you take an oath? And he says, no, it's against my religion. That's what, that's what it is. And Haman says to, to the Hashverosh, if they were consistently faithful to their Torah, you couldn't have a claim on them. 
but they're not consistently faithful to the Torah, so you've got a right to ask, so then why don't you keep my laws if you're not keeping your own laws? And so we see here the source of anti-Semitism is our difference. But the cure for anti-Semitism is our difference. If we would celebrate our difference, embrace our difference, live our difference, and not seek to try and be like anybody else, then we would be, I don't know about accepted, but, but we would be living our purpose. But if we're unfaithful, sometimes it's against our religion, sometimes it's okay to do certain things, sometimes we do what the nations of the world want us to do, sometimes we stand firm and we do our own things, people get confused. Who are these Jews? What do they really believe in? Because if we look at, the key to this is, is in a Natsiv, where the Natsiv says, on this description that, that Bilam gives of the Jewish people, Hein am levadad yishkon. And the Natsiv explains that posuk, when the nation, when the Jewish people live as an am, not a goy. And the Natsiv explains the difference between an am and a goy. An am is a community of people. A goy is a political entity. If we live as a community of people, yishkon. We will live with a mishkan, we will live with peace, we will live with tranquility, we will live in, we will live in our homes. But uva goyim? But if we try to operate like a nation, like one of the goyim, if we operate like a political entity, lo yitchashar, they will never take us seriously, they will never accept us. And that again becomes our choice. Are we going to live our own identity, or are we going to try and be kecholai goyim? So this trend, we need to be alert to the fact that the days of being part of the world are over. We're no longer part of the world, we're separate from the world, and that is our destiny. That's what Hashem wants for us, to be separate from the world, and it's in our separateness that the story is going to unfold. The story is not going to unfold in our, in our togetherness with the rest of the world. The second trend is that silos are breaking down. And here again we see an interest, but by silos breaking down I mean I don't know about you, but I no longer know who is a Haredi and who isn't. I have met people who dress like Haredi, and they're not even, they're not even, don't even keep Shabbos. I've, I've met people who dress in very ordinary ways, and sometimes less than that, and they have amazing hearts and souls, and they're very, very meticulous about the mitzvot they keep. I just don't really know anymore who is and who isn't. And that's important to understand. We've got to stop the labeling because people don't fit into the boxes anymore. The boxes are irrelevant, actually, because those silos have come down. There's a, there's a flow. There are people who are Haredi. I don't know if Rabbi Yonim there calls himself a Haredi or not. I'm sure the Haredi would call him Haredi. And he's in army uniform sitting over here. And everybody's saying, the Haredi don't go to the army. Well, some don't. Some do. It's fluid. You can't categorize people that way. Person is, is Dati Lumi? Is he really? Is he really Lumi? Does he really believe in Israel? Is he really Dati? Maybe he's really Haredi. How are you going to judge people? Why are you judging people? What's the point in it? So, a long time people were in boxes for whatever reason. Those days are over. And we've got to celebrate that and understand that. And Haman teaches us how. Am echad mefuzaru meforad ben Amim. This is a unified nation that is scattered. It is a unified nation of diverse people. I remember one of the things I noticed soon after we came on Aliyah is that Israel is probably the most diverse country, certainly that I've ever lived in, much more diverse than the United States. It's one of the most diverse countries. Because in the United States, yes, there are lots of diverse people, but how many of them do you meet? In, in Beverly Wood there, how many, how many different cultures do you meet in Beverly Wood? Three Mexicans, modern Orthodox Jews, and a few white Americans and a few black Americans, four cultures. Is that, is that called multicultural? Yeah, you walk in the street, you stand in a bus stop, you go into a restaurant, look at the cultures you've got around you. It's the most multicultural society that there is. But it's also Amechad, one value system, one God, one religion. It's such a unique social experiment where with unity of purpose, and Haman understands this, Amechad Mufuzara Muforad. It's a single nation, but they're broken up into diverse pieces. Each Jew is a world unto himself. Every community is, is their own, and that's why there's machlokes, and they argue with each other, and they talk. But just bring them a challenge, and it's amechad, and immediately they're one nation. They have all the makings of an integrated, unified nation, 
and all the makings of a split nation where every person is his own boss and every community is its own community. It's both together. That's what the Jewish people are. And that's the world we're moving into. Am echad beforad. There are people who will be learning in yeshiva full time and there'll be people who will be in sec- the secular world full time and some will be half and half and in the army and out of the army and partially in the army. All of these different, but it's going to be very fluid and you won't be able to label people that way because we have to recognize that we're an amechad befuzar mefarad. We have all the strengths of a diverse nation and all the strengths of a unified nation, and we should embrace that and celebrate and that and live accordingly. Notice this and, and live that way and, and see. Some of you would have seen that clip that went around on the internet of that Knesset woman crying in Knesset about how she had been robbed of her Jewish identity by the Israeli educational system. That wouldn't have happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Who would have, you wouldn't have had such a thing. Here you've got a completely secular person being open to learning. And you've got Haredi people being open to service. Does that mean all secular people want to learn? No. But previously, no secular people wanted to do that. Does that mean all Haredi people want to serve? And service doesn't mean dafka in the army in combat. There are lots of ways that different Haredi people are looking at opportunities to serve. Does it mean everyone is? No. But a few years ago, nobody was. You've got to understand the enormity of the trend, how big this trend is. Just as the trend of Am Levadad Yishkon, of where it's seen as a, a, a notion that lives on its own globally, so in Eretz Israel, we're an Am Echad Mefuzaru Mefarad. We're a unified nation open to learn in a way we've never been open before. And since when did we come open? There was a movement already over the last few years. There's been a, a movement in that, in that direction. But October the 7th changed everything. People who never thought they would be open to learn are open to learning. And people who never thought they would be open to serving are open to serving. Everything changed in a couple of hours. Everything changed. And we need to realize that this is a time to make Yom Mishteh V'Simcha U'Mishloach Manot Ish L'Re'ehu U'Matanot L'Evyonim Send gifts what does the Zohar say when it says that Avram gave gifts to his children from his Pilakshim when they went off to the east? The Zohar says it was Chochma. He gave them wisdom. The wisdom of the east, Asian wisdom, comes from Abraham. They know it, in fact. The, the Asians know that Abraham is the source of, the, of their wisdom. But that's what Matanot means. Manot ish Matanot le'evionim. is not just a good meal and some shalach monas. That's very nice. But connect with people. Connect with people. Teach people. Learn from people. We have an opportunity now where the whole learning dynamic is switched around. Another v'na'apochu. We've seen it in the general world already for many years, where children are the teachers. If you need to uh, repair your computer, you ask your child. If you, need a, you get a new piece of technology, you want to know how it works, you ask your child. If you want to know what the world's likely to look like in 10 years' time, don't try and figure it out yourself. You haven't got a clue. Ask your child. You'll have a clearer idea of what, where the world might be going in terms of understanding of technology. So that understanding that we have to be willing to learn from young people. That doesn't mean that older people don't have a role. The young people want to learn from the old people too. They want to learn something different. They want to learn values and wisdom from the old people. But the old people also want to learn from the, from the young people. Leave it remember, that's the work that we did in your institution with, with law enforcement, teaching them how to relate to the new generation. This very principle of anapoch, that now we've got to learn from people who used to be our students and to realize they now become our teachers. And it's Israel today. The young people who are fighting in Gaza are experiencing life in ways that the rest of us can't even imagine. And we need to be willing to learn from them. They understand the Torah in ways we can't understand the Torah. They understand the mitzvahs in ways we can't understand the mitzvahs. Even the secular ones among them, because they've been through life experiences that we haven't. And we've got to get together and be in shloach manot ish l're'ehu, them to us and us to them. We need to teach them what we know. They need to teach us what they know. We need to be humble students as they need to be humble students. And the nation needs to be engaged in a massive exercise of sharing experience and sharing learning because the nation is able, is open for that. 
And in the Korean Mektiv, when it says in the, in the Esther, Vekiblu Ayudim, we read it, Vekiblu Ayudim, but it's written Vekibel in the singular, and the Jews accepted upon themselves, but it's written in the singular, he, he, it, he accepted upon himself, meaning that the Jewish people says, Rashi, Kulam Keish Echad, although we're Mefurad, Mefuzaru, Mefurad, Ben Ha'amim, Kulam Keish Echad, we all became one during Purim. That's what set the rest of Jewish history in place. Because at that time, we all became one. And the third and the last trend is just a new and vital Zionistic idealism, that Zionism was dead. The Zionism that got Israel to where it got to, that kind of did its thing and got the state, and the state was flourishing until October the 6th. And, and what's, what do we need Zionists for? Israel is, is wealthy, Israel is, is exporting, Israel is producing. You don't need the blue boxes anymore, with people putting pennies into the blue boxes to come to Israel, to give money to plant a tree in some forest. And the oven, they carried on with it. That was just PR. Israel didn't need that. Israel was giving aid to other countries. Israel wasn't the poor neighbor anymore. So what, what's the role of Zionism? But there's a new idealistic Zionism. The difference between this Zionism and the old Zionism is the old Zionism started off as a substitute for Yiddishkeit. There was a belief that the Yiddishkeit of the shtetl was over, that that era was over, and that Torah as it was known and Jewish life as it was known was over. And this was time for a new vision of what Jewish life is, and, and, and Zionism was core and was central to what that new vision was, and, and Jewish life as such didn't play an important part, which led to this woman in the Knesset crying that she'd lost her Jewish identity, because the Zionists of old established an educational system that robbed people of their Jewishness, because Jewishness wasn't important. The new Zionism that was born on October the 7th sees Eretz Israel, sees Israel as a central tenet of Judaism not as an alternative to Judaism, and not as a substitute for Judaism, it sees there's a recognition by secular and by religious that we need both. We, we need Eretz Israel, and we need Am Yisrael living uh, the life of, of the Torah. Again, not every secular person gets it, not every religious person gets it, but it's the genesis, it's the beginning of a changing paradigm. Three changing paradigms. We've got to be very careful not to fossilize ourselves and find ourselves living six months ago. That's how fast the world is changing. And in the world of technology, you know that, that if you're, six, if you're living six months ago, if you're living before the days of AI, where are you in the world? The world has left you way behind. That's only a year or two ago. That's not a long time ago. And the same here. If you're living before October the 7th and you still see the world, you see the Haredim as you used to see them, you see the Chilonim as you used to see them, you see the Dati Lumi as you used to see them, you see Israel as you used to, you see America as you used to, you see anti-Semitism as you used to, then your history has left you behind already. One has to understand that everything has changed. I've just chosen three trends that it's easy for us to notice, to see, to watch, and to participate, to be part in, to understand that we're in it on our own and that's okay to understand that we are both diverse and unified, and silos are breaking, and to understand that there's a new Zionistic idealism that is different from anything that was before, one in which everybody can participate. It doesn't matter whether you're an Atura Karata from Maya Shaorim or you're a secular person from the Kibbutz, it's a Zionism that can talk to everybody, a Zionism that includes an overarching Yiddishkeit, an overarching Jewishness, which if we are not acknowledging, my goodness, the Goyim are making sure that, that we know exactly what that is. They will teach it to us if we deny it ourselves, and that in this new world we will be able to celebrate our Jewishness, celebrate our commitment to, to Eretz Yisrael as core to our Jewishness, celebrate all the diverse people in, in our Jewish people, and, and understand their differences, enjoy their differences, allow a flow of love and of information and of knowledge and of, of wisdom, and being able to look at the world around us and just be okay with where it is. Somebody asked me today, a non-Jewish uh, person in, in business, how I feel about the anti-Semitism. Am I very offended by it? And I said to them, offense is something you choose. You choose to be offended or you choose not to be offended. You don't have to be offended. A person can choose to act offensively, but I don't have to be offended by an offensive person. You want to be offensive, be offensive. It doesn't have to offend me unless I allow myself to be offended. I don't let myself be offended. I'm, I'm not offended by anti-Semitism at all. To me, as I explained to him, 
It's like a dog barking at me. I move away from the dog. I watch the dog. I might be a little curious about the dog and why he's barking. But am I offended because the dog's barking at me? The dog doesn't like me. I'm offended. Not at all. Because I know I'm a human being and he's a dog. That's what anti-Semitism is to me. I know I'm a Jew and you're an anti-Semite. And if I know that and I know what it means to be a Jew, if I really understand what it means to be a Jew, and I did a clip recently, some of you have seen it, of what it is. What do we mean? with What is a Jew? If I understand that and I feel that deep in my heart, I'm levadad yishkon. I'm not trying to be a goy. I'm trying to be an am. I'm trying to be part of the Jewish community. And I will be shochen. We will have peace and we will have prosperity without having to worry. The rest of the world will have to support us, not because they want to and not because they choose to, but because that will be the way Hashem will build the world and create the world in such a way that, that history un- unfolds. So we're living through hard times. We're living through tragic times. We're living through times of sadness and loss. But don't lose sight of the awe and the wonder of the time that we're living in and of the amazing things we're seeing and choose to participate. Don't obstruct, don't try and fight it. Don't try and sit and around your tables and give answers and solutions to what Bibi should be doing and what Saul should be doing and what Biden should be doing. Just, just leave it to Hashem, let it, let it play out. It, it's not gonna make a difference. Your conversations aren't going to make a difference. And even if you were a powerful person, if you were the Bibi or the Biden or the Trump or the whoever, it's also not going to make a difference. Leiv Malachim Yad Hashem, the Rebbein Hashem is playing this out. And we've got to let it happen. So don't try and obstruct. Don't observe, because it will pass you by. And you'll become a fossil. Me, you're there. In Eit Kazu. Do you want it all to come from somewhere else and you weren't there? Where were you? You were asleep when it happened. Rather notice it, watch it, follow it, embrace it, and celebrate it. Thank you for joining us. We've had a lot of people who weren't able to come tonight. Young people have got exams and tests. Some people aren't well. Some people are traveling. But very happy to see the people who are here and, and some new people, the guests from Los Angeles. Wonderful to have you with us. I know that I have you every day, but it's not really having you in the same way as uh, being live in a shir. And Nicholas has come all the way from England to be at the shir live. My cousins have come all the way from Rechavia appreciate that too. And all of you, once again, also thanks to Binyamin, to Rav Shalom Cook, for setting this all up and making this all possible. These are times we need each other. You can't be on your own. It's through the, the being together, through the, the sense of community, that we're able to share both the hardship of the times that we're in and the wonder of the times that we're in, and to get through it with more, more comfort, more certainty, and more trust that absolutely our salvation will come no matter what we do or don't do. And we're just privileged to be part of that unfolding.